stay standing as we read God's word of this resurrection story this morning. Early in the morning on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone was moved away from the entrance. She ran at once to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, gasping for breath. They took the master from the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple left immediately for the tomb and they ran neck and neck. The other disciple got to the tomb first, outrunning Peter. Stopping to look in, he he saw the pieces of linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Simon Peter arrived after him, entered the tomb, observed the linen cloths lying there, and the kerchief used to cover his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but separate, neatly folded by itself. And then the other disciple, the one who had gotten there first, went into the tomb, took one look at the evidence, and believed. No one yet knew from the scripture that he had to rise from the dead, So the disciples then went back home. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, she knelt to look into the tomb and saw two angels sitting there dressed in white, one at the head, the other at the foot of where Jesus' body had been laid. And they said to her, woman, why do you weep? Well, they took my master, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. After she said this, she turned away and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't recognize him. Jesus spoke to her, woman, why do you weep? Who are you looking for? She, thinking he was the gardener, said, sir, if you took him, just tell me where you put him so that I can care for him. Jesus said, Mary. And turning to face him, she said in Hebrew, Rabbani, meaning teacher. And Jesus said, don't cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go to my brothers and tell them I ascend to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. And so Mary Magdalene went telling the news to the disciples. I saw the master and she told them everything he said to her. Let's pray. God, we come to you now with grateful hearts. We come to you now, Father, so grateful that you did die, that you died on the cross, that you rose again, that we have new life, Lord. We thank you, Father, that we can come into your house with expectancy that you can meet us right where we're at. Lord, we all come from different backgrounds and from different stories. We're going through different things. We all go through trials and hardships, and we all come today even with things pressing on our own shoulders, Lord. But the one thing we all have in common is the great need for peace, Lord. We need your peace today. We need peace, Lord, where we're struggling. We need peace to know that no matter what, where we can see the outcome or not, you hold the future. You see us right where we are, that you've got a plan even after death, Lord. And so we come now and we ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd open our hearts, that you'd open our minds. Lord, that you would do what only you can do. And that's cut through the temporal straight to the eternal and open our hearts and our souls to your voice. We ask for that now, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. You can be seated. Thank you, band, fantastic worship, amazing. Well, you all look wonderful today on Easter Sunday. You look fantastic. I know that uh, we're normally a very casual church here on Sundays, but on Easter, I can always count that Pastor Greg's gonna let go of the flannel and put on a nice button down with starch on it on Easter Sunday. You look good, Pastor Greg. How many of you went and bought something new to wear to Easter Sunday today? Come on, show your hands. How many of you wanted to, but you thought your budget would appreciate if you upcycled what was already in your closet that you always think I'll wear and then you never do? Yes, we took the kids to the Rentham Outlets. We love getting dressed in our Easter best on Sunday, on Easter Sunday. We always like to go buy new outfits for us and the kids. And we took the kids to the outlets and then realized five minutes onto the parking lot that we had made a huge mistake because everybody goes shopping for their Easter best on the Saturday before Easter, regardless of whether they're churchgoers or not. Can I have a good amen? 
And so we were there and we were trying to find some stuff, but we love that. I don't know why it's not a rule. You don't have to wear new clothes on Easter Sunday. You certainly don't have to dress up. God doesn't care one way or the other. But as a society, we tend to just get in our Easter best. Tyler and I love it, I think, because we've been doing it since we were born. I brought some pictures from our childhood scrapbooks I thought you'd like to see. Look, there's me and my mom. My mom made those matching dresses. I was so cute, wasn't I? Yeah. And then I brought Pastor Tyler. Don't worry, he's not getting out of this. Watch, watch how cute he is here. Look at him, the little baby. It is white little, one of those things called, uh, no, the shoes, the can't remember the name. Anyways, how cute he is right there. His little embroidered romper. He's so cute. He and his sister are 53 weeks apart. But look, Pastor Tyler in the tie. I don't think, look at Nona's Easter hat. I love that. I don't think, Tyler, you've worn a tie like that since about 1989 right there. You've, re, you've reverted, converted to bow ties since then. Yes, you look good. You know, many of you, you got all your kids up and at them this morning. You ironed clothes last night. Come on, how many mamas took Easter pictures this morning? Me and my kids, we, we've kind of given up on that. They're older now. They're like, please, dear God, don't make me do this. Bennett Claire still wants to. She and I were in the front yard taking pictures in our matching dresses this morning. Uh, but we, I, I remember the days when it was just a lot, but we still took pictures. I brought our best family picture that we ever took on an Easter Sunday <laughs> right there for you. That was legit Easter Sunday, 2015. We had just done five services, two night services in the back bay. And uh, we, that was all we had at the end. I was pregnant with Ben Claire. Uh, looks like Peter was drunk with candy and <laughs> Whitaker's life was being threatened within an inch. If he did not sit here and take this picture right now, my God, so help me. But all of you mamas struggling to get your babies to church, we know how hard it is. Keep doing it. Keep snapping those pictures. Who cares if they're perfect? Because I promise you a decade from now, you're going to look back. Those are going to be your best ones. I promise you that. You will remember those days. Amen. Sunday, Easter Sunday is about our Easter best. And there is something about dressing in our Easter best that resonates from the resurrection story. It's this invitation to be in our Easter best. And that's really my main thought for you today. And there's three big details from this story that we just read out of the account of the disciple John that wrote uh, this story. There's three big details that will, I think, turn into the application for our own lives that I want you to see here today. The first is the linens that were lying in the tomb. The second is that Mary thought Jesus was the gardener. I want you to see that today. And the third thing that I want us to see is that the face covering was folded neatly. I think Jesus really was a neat freak just like me. Yes. I always tell my boys cleanliness is next to godliness. That's nowhere in the Bible except for right there that he folded things neatly. But these three seemingly small details have a lot of life application to you. I'm going to show you those today. So let me show you now. If you're new to Christianity or maybe you get confused between the connection between Judaism and Passover was just a couple days and now today's Easter and you're not really sure, I want to bring this into focus for you because there's a lot that has to do with one another. First and foremost is that Jesus is the complete fulfillment of God's plan to bring us into to right standing with our creator. That's the first and foremost. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's plan. From humanity's conception, we have been going, as a human race, we have been going against our creator's plans, his design, his original intention for his creation. Sure, we may do good deeds every now and then. We'll see a TikTok video with some cute kittens and we'll feel good about our life and give to some humanitarian relief aid and we'll volunteer. Yes, humans can do good things, but if we really begin to reason one to another, one thing I think that over time you and I would agree on is that the core of humanity, at the core of every man, at the core of every woman, when you squeeze and you see what's really on the core, what's in the core is rotten. It's not good. This is what the Bible means by we are sinners in need of a savior. And some of us struggle with that idea, but let me just see if I can prove it to you. When you get backed into a corner, 
Someone's coming against you. Someone, someone is offending you. Someone's violating you, right? What comes out? Is it goodness and loving and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness? No, because at the core, what we are is sinners. We come out swinging with passive manipulation and aggression and cursing and getting out for our own interests. Some of us, we think we're so good, yet we will easily, out of greed, step on another to get to the top. Will we not? See, because at the core, we are sinners, And God knew this. And because humanity at the core were sinners, we broke God's law. Way back to the Garden of Eden, we broke God's laws. He said, this is my plan. This is my my laws. This is what I want you to walk in. And we thought we knew better than God. And so we violated his law. The other thing about us humans is that we love justice. Do we not? Right? When a law is broken, we love justice. We demand the penalty be paid. I went down, I had a listing, I'm a real estate agent, I went to a listing on Commonwealth Ave that I had a few weeks ago, a couple, last week, gosh, it feels like a few weeks ago, but it was just like six days ago. And so I was there six days ago, and how many know, when I did not feed the parking meter because I forgot to bring quarters and I didn't have my wallet with me, the city of Boston wanted justice. They left me a $40 parking ticket. What could have cost me six bucks cost me 40 bucks, right? If someone runs a red light and they accidentally kill somebody, even if they did not mean to, it was a complete accident as a community, or if it was your own family member, what would you want? Justice. A law was broken. Therefore, we want restitution. We want a civil case. We want a loss. We want money. We want something to make it right. There is something about our nature that needs loving kindness, forgiveness, but also justice. And the reason we're like that is because we are created in the image or in the likeness of our creator God. God is both merciful and loving, and he's also a God of justice. And when a law is broken, he demands, because of his just nature, a penalty to be paid. He demands justice. He loves the people that break the law, but when a law is broken, just like you and I would agree, a penalty must be paid, right? And so through reasoning, we see that God is not mean. This is why many of you stay away from Christianity. This is why many of you will appease your spouse or your friend and come to church with them. But you actually want nothing to do with God because if God was so good, if he was so loving, he would not send people to hell. Yet, when someone violates your laws, you demand justice, but God is bad for demanding justice. See, this is the problem with human reasoning, is that we put expectations on our creator. In other words, we expect him to live our way instead of us living his way. And so, this was the human problem. This was the the hardship. This was the separation between us and God. And so before Jesus, God, in his kindness, determined a system to bring people, in other words, to be able to pay the penalty so that we could become into right standing with him. And before that, and before Jesus comes, before Resurrection Sunday, there was the book of Leviticus. And it's one of the very first books in the Bible. And it's where God is giving legislation to his people. He says, hey, you keep breaking my laws, but in my loving kindness, I'm going to create a system here where because I need justice, but because I love you, I'm going to create a system here where we can be in right standing together. And I want to show you this. In Leviticus chapter 16, verse 2 and 3, I want you to see this. You're like, man, I was coming to Easter Sunday. I didn't know I was getting Leviticus today. <laughs> well, buckle your seatbelts. We're going. The Lord said to Moses, warn your brother Aaron not to enter the most holy place behind the inner curtain whenever he chooses. If he does, he will die. For the ark's cover, or the place of atonement, many of us know this day as Yom Kippur. It was the day where the sins of the people could be atoned. He said, is there, and I myself am present in the cloud above the atonement cover. When Aaron enters the sanctuary area, he must follow these instructions fully. He must bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Verse four, he must put on his linen tunic and the linen undergarments worn next to his body. He must tie the linen sash around his waist and put the linen turban on his head. These are sacred garments, so he must bathe himself in water before he puts them on. 
later in the chapter, verse 23, when Aaron goes back into the tabernacle, he must take off the linen garments that he was wearing when he entered the most holy place, and he must leave the garments there. Then he must bathe himself with water in a sacred place, put on his regular garments, and go out to sacrifice a burnt offering for himself and a burnt offering for the people. And through this process, he will pure him purify himself and the people, making them right with the Lord. So it was through the shedding of a blood, an animal, a sacrifice, and it was the taking on and the taking off of the linen garments that made the people right with God. It was the system, it was his legislation, and it was his legal system, if you will. In other words, when we break a penalty, here's how you pay the price. Now go back to the resurrection account from John's story because remember I told you that Jesus is the fulfillment of that legal system because eventually God got so sick of all the burnt offerings. He said, I'm so tired of the burnt bulls and I'm tired of the sacrificed lambs and I'm tired of the doves. You say you want me, but then you sinned and you know you can just throw a pigeon out and you'll be okay with me. He said, I'm tired of this. What I want from you is love and I want mercy and I want justice. And so he said, you know what? Humans will never be able to sacrifice enough. So he said, so therefore I will send myself and I will pay the final price. Remember John, what he says, John 20, verse 10, stooping to look in, he saw the pieces of linen cloth lying here. Lock into this. This is the first big detail. He saw the pieces of linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. And Simon Peter arrived after him, entered the tomb, and he observed what? The linen cloths lying there. See, Jesus is telling the same story of Leviticus here with the details that he provides about Jesus' resurrection. The empty tomb is the most holy place where Aaron offered sacrifices. And Jesus' body as the sacrifice lying in the tomb is the fulfillment of the sacrificial offering that bears witness to the covenant that God has established relationship back with humankind. And I want you to see the presence of the linen cloths that John tells us that they saw in the tomb just lying there. Because just as the high priest, watch this, would take off his garment after he had made the sacrifice and lie them there in the most holy place. So Jesus, our high priest, has left his linen cloths behind after he finished the work on the cross and made atonement in the fulfillment of the most holy place, his temple, his body. John reminds us that Jesus' resurrection is crucial for our atonement. The work on the cross, the shed blood is so crucial for the forgiveness of our sins. But church, you have to hear me. It would be incomplete without the resurrection. Until the garments, the linen cloth, cloth was removed, our salvation was not secured. The Bible tells us that Jesus left his linen cloths behind. He finished the work of restoring our right relationship. And because of the work that he did, you and I can have utter peace and blessed assurance, confident hope that because our faith is in his finished work and those linen claws are lying in that tomb, you and I, when we breathe our last breath on this side of eternity, you and I can stand before creator God knowing that the penalty has been paid, that we can't earn our way to salvation, we can't do enough good deeds, we can't say we're sorry enough, we can't come to enough Easter and Christmas services to just make sure we're okay with God because that is not makes you okay with God. What makes you okay with God is those linen cloths, those grave clothes that are lying in the tomb. But when he came out of the tomb, here's the second thing I want you to see, is that he was different. The Bible says that Mary thought he was the gardener. The Bible tells us that after between the 40 days that Jesus uh, rose again and then ascended to the Father as the right hand of God, as God himself, during that 40 days, he appeared over 10 times to over 500 people to create a, a, an eyewitness testimony to corroborate the authenticity of his resurrection. But if you study those times that he appeared, it, the, every single instance, nobody recognized him. They would just be walking down the road. Jesus would show up right next to him, walking, talking. And then they, all of a sudden, the Bible said, all of a sudden, after they would be with him for several hours or several minutes, their eyes, the Bible said, God would just illuminate their eyes. They would have an epiphany and they'd be like, 
oh my gosh, it's you. Now think about this. They had been with him for over almost four years, walking and talking and doing ministry together daily, running from the cops together. I mean, the, they knew what Jesus looked like. Mary Magdalene herself had funded all of Jesus's ministry along with a lot of other prominent women. G- Mary knew who he was. And yet he comes to her face. They stand six inches from me. He probably spits on her face. <laughs> and he says, why are you crying? Why are you weeping? And she, did, she she's like, look, if you took him, just tell me. Because at least I can care for him. And then he says her name. And she recognizes him. Mary. But she thought he was the gardener. Now, I don't know where he got these clothes I mean, maybe the angels gave him, I mean, he is God himself. If he created the world, I think he can create gardening clothes. <laughs> but notice he appeared as a gardener. He didn't appear as a Roman soldier. He didn't appear as a groundskeeper. He didn't appear as another person there burying their own family. The, the Bible goes out of the way. God goes out of the way to tell us he looked like a gardener. And why is this? This is so fascinating to me. Because when God himself, when Jesus left the linen cloths behind, when he undressed his old self, he comes out looking as his original design. God himself created the Garden of Eden. He is the gardener. He is the great gardener who tends and cultivates to our souls. He is the one who produces any harvest in our life. Any good thing that you and I produce is cultivated by the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is God himself who is the gardener. So when Mary looks at him and thinks he's the gardener, she is not mistaken, my friend. She is actually seeing him for who he is. Is. And some of you have been working so hard in your own strength to produce good things in your life. You are working every day to make your marriage work, to make your parenting work, to get through this hard time, to provide, and you're always broken, you're always struggling. Guess what? You have not submitted to the great cultivator of your life. This is the message of Easter. It's the invitation to step out of your tomb, to leave your grave clothes behind and to dress in your Easter best. But the last detail that I want you to see, my favorite one, is that when they looked in the tomb, they saw the grave clothes just lying to the side and separate was this napkin, this face covering that covered Jesus's face when he breathed, when he was dead. And it was folded neatly separately. The Bible tells us, takes time to tell us it was separate and folded. Now, why is this significant? Today, after church, you'll probably go out to eat or you'll go to your lunch at your house. And uh, just like us, we actually, we do hibachi. Uh, I don't know why, but several years ago, that became our Easter tradition. It was mainly because we were too exhausted to cook with four little kids. And then we realized, oh shoot, we forgot to make reservations and you can't get into anywhere for Easter lunch without reservations. How about Asian food? Yes, we will go to that. And nobody was there and they cook for you and they make balloons for your kids and it's the best Easter lunch ever. So we do hibachi. So later you will find us at Saga in Foxborough. That is where we go. And so we go to Easter lunch and every time we go to lunch anywhere, anywhere we go out to eat, I teach my kids, take your napkin, put it on your lap, right? And this was the true. In this context, Every Hebrew boy, every would have known that the, the, the uh, napkin has everything to do with a master and a servant. And so when a servant was getting the table ready in Hebrew context, everything would be meticulous. It would be ready. And then the servant would step right out of sight to just watch the table and observe his master. And when a master finished eating, right, he'd do just like we do, clean his hands, clean his beard. And if he was done, he'd throw the, t- the napkin on the table. But watch this. In Hebrew context, the tradition goes that if he was not done, he would fold the napkin neatly, place it beside his meal, and it would signify to the servant waiting in the wings, do not touch the table because I am coming back. So when Simon and John look inside the tomb and they see the claws lying there, and they see the napkin folded neatly. It signaled to them, I'm coming back. I finished the work, my grave clothes are there, but I'm coming back. And I have to close this Easter sermon by asking us all a question. When he does come back, 
when we experience our great homecoming. Maybe you'll meet him. Your homecoming will be before he actually splits the sky. The Bible says he will split the sky and we will hear a great trumpet. And the earth that will be in such desolation will actually receive its Messiah, Savior, its deliverer. Maybe you will be in that crowd that sees him come down from the sky. Or maybe you'll breathe your last breath here, even in doubt. You maybe still won't believe him when you die, but the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And so I don't know when you're gonna meet him. I don't know which way it will be, but when you meet him, I have to ask you a question. Will you be dressed in your Easter best? In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus tells a story and he's talking to a group of religious leaders of his day. Pharisees, they held the Jewish law. They were good people. They did good things. They made sure and do all the religious ritual. And Jesus says, let me tell you what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. And so he tells this story of a king that is throwing a wedding feast for his son. And so the king goes, he's so excited that his son's getting married. So he goes and he invites all the special guests, all the important people. And he says, come to my son's wedding. And the Bible, the story that Jesus tells is that these people were either ignoring the invitation, they were too self-consumed with their own affairs, they didn't have time to go, wouldn't make time to do it. Um, And then he gets so annoyed, so he sends them again. He's like, no, they really need to come to my son's wedding. They need to be there. And so he sends the messenger again. And this time, Jesus tells the story that they got so aggravated that they insulted, they beat them up, they killed the messengers even. And so the king, he gets so enraged that he just burns their cities down. He wipes out those people. And then he decides, fine, if they don't want to come to my son's wedding feast, I'm going to invite everybody. So he sends his messenger, go to the highways and the byways and you invite whosoever, whoever soever should believe in me will not perish, but have everlasting life. He says, you invite everybody. And so in this biblical context, Jesus is talking to Orthodox Jews and he's saying, fine, if you won't accept, just like you have killed all of the prophets for the last 2000 years before me, fine. I'm telling you that God is now opening salvation to both Jew and Gentile alike. There is now no male or female, Greek or Jew, slave or free. Everyone comes as equals to the God's house. And he said, so he goes and he invites everybody and he fills the banquet hall. And and then in verse 11, and I want you to see this because this detail is often very overlooked by the church. But it cannot be ignored today, church. Not by this pastor. Verse 11 Now, when the king entered the banquet hall, he looked with glee over all his guests. But then he noticed a guest who was not wearing the wedding robe provided for him. So he said, my friend, how is it that you're here and you're not wearing your wedding garment? He says, but the man was speechless. And then the king turned to his servant and said, tie him up and throw him into outer darkness where there will be great sorrow with weeping and grinding of teeth for everyone is invited to enter in. But listen to this, but few respond in excellence. What? I mean, this man came to the wedding. He at least was better than the people who ignored it. He was at least better than the people who were too busy and self-consumed with their own affairs to come. Why is he getting thrown to outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth? This is Easter. You're not supposed to talk about hell. So I start talking about heaven. We have been talking about heaven for centuries, church. And are we wearing our wedding garments? Now, wedding garments weren't special, but what they did was they showed that you had honor for the host. And so why was he thrown to outer darkness? Because it was the posture of his heart. He said, I'll come to your wedding. I'll eat your food. I'll take your blessings. I'll drink your wine. I'll have a good time. Let's do this. I'll come just as I am, but I'll also stay just as I am. And I just have to ask you, does this resonate? Because if you truly want to experience resurrection life, if you really want to go to heaven, if you really want to be in relationship for an eternity with God, it's not enough that he died on the cross, church. It's not enough that he gave you pardon for your sins. You must step out of your own grave and put on your resurrection too. This is why the apostle Paul wrote, put on your new nature. 
Does this mean that you'll be perfect? No, because only he is perfect. But it means that every day you're living with an awareness that I've got to put on the likeness of God. This is why we come to church every seven days. This is why the apostle said, do not forsake the meeting of the saints. Why? Because this is where we come and we wash our wedding garments and we make sure we're ready for God. It's not a ritual. It's not a to box we check off. No, it's where I come and I make sure my heart gets cleaned from the last six days that dirtied it again. Because I want to be ready for my homecoming. I want to be ready for the master. Do you want to be ready for the master? Church, I know this is not a typical hero's feel good about yourself, but there is a disservice that I would do to you if I did not give you an invitation to ensure that your heart is ready to make your make, meet your maker, to make peace with God. So I'm going to ask you to do that. I'm going to ask everyone to close their eyes and bow your heads. Our band's going to come up because we're going to close with just a, a moment for you to just right there in your own heart. Only you know if you're wearing your wedding garment. Only you know if if you've been ignoring the invitation. Only you know if you're too busy for God. Only you know if you are just, God, I'm going to come to you on my own terms and you're going to like it. Only you know the posture of your heart. So I want to ask you, really it's not me. I just feel it's the Holy Spirit asking you, friend, would you live in this new life? I provided for you. Father, we just come to you now and I just ask you, Holy Spirit, prick our hearts. Even though of us who put our faith in you a long time ago, show us if we're not wearing our wedding garments, Lord. And so with every eye closed and every head bowed, just to give people a moment of you, I'm gonna pray for you and I wanna know if I'm praying for you. And if that's you and you say, Pastor, when you pray, I need you to pray for me because I don't have my wedding garment on. If Jesus came back today, I would try to go hide somewhere because I'm not ready to meet him. But today I wanna make my peace with God. I wanna make sure I have confidence assurance. If that's you, would you just raise your hand and say, that's me, Pastor. When you pray, I want you to pray for me. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. I see hands going up everywhere. There's no need to be condemned in this house today. There's no need need to feel shame. All of us were not ready. All of us have been given the invitation. All we have to do is receive his love today. Receive what he provided for you. Amen. Receive it. Come on, why don't we stand? We're going to close. I'm going to pray with you and then we're going to sing. You know, on the when Jesus died, the thief on the cross next to him who had been insulting him just hours before, he came to his realization and he said, oh, surely you're the son of God. Remember me on this day. And Jesus said, surely you will be with me in paradise. That is the heart of repentance. So I want to pray for you. Lord, I pray for every person here. See our hearts now. You see every hand raised. You see every heart humbled. And I pray on this Easter Sunday that we would take serious your resurrection and live in your new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we're so glad that you stuck around for the entire message. You know, everything we do at Story Heights Church is done with the hope that we connect your story to God's story because we believe that God can and will take your story to new heights. So while you may not be with us in person, we still wanna give you the opportunity to respond to the call of Jesus. Maybe you're watching right now and you'd say, you know what, and I've been trying to do my life my own way. uh, And honestly, it's it's just not working. And listen, we've all been there before. Uh, If you can say, I believe that Jesus died for me because he loves me and that you truly want to live in the fullness of what he has in store for you, I would encourage you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, say thank you for your cross, for your love, for your grace and your forgiveness. Say, I was going my way but now I choose to go your way. I want to make you my Lord and Savior. Forgive my sin and set me on a new path. Amen. That's huge. That's such a big deal. You know, giving your life to Jesus is the first big step in a faith journey that's going to last the rest of your life on this earth. So don't let it go unnoticed. We'd love for you to fill out our digital connect card at the link below because although you aren't with us in person, We want to get you connected. If you don't live in our area and don't belong to a local church, we'd love to connect you with a great Jesus and Bible teaching one. And if you are in the area, we invite you to come in person because we believe church is essential to your spiritual growth. And honestly, it's just one big party every Sunday. So go ahead and click that connect card and a member of our team will be in touch. And that's really all we have for you now. 
And we hope to wait and see how God is moving in your life. So remember, keep letting God take your story to new heights. He's got such great things for you. It's the truth.